Okay, so we stopped the last increment on our first anaphora, which is always divisible by 3 or 7. So that shows you divine intent, that shows you divine design, that shows you we counted the syllables right, that shows you the God's bracketing history, and it's the most dramatic one. Truly, I tell you. Okay? So that's like, hi, I'm here, I'm in person, I'm talking. So these are the most dramatic events of future history, whenever you see this phrase. And we're coming up on one, so it's kind of relevant to us to understand what this means. Now what's so interesting is that here in Luke, this whole phrase is never used. He completely avoids that anaphora. He never uses it. He uses the same timeline. He uses all this, the, most of the same other words, although there's a couple of words he's missing on purpose that are really dramatic. So by omitting, and this is important, in Greek they do this. When you pointedly omit something, then you're calling attention to the thing you omit. Since Luke never uses this, he's expecting you to A, know what it is, B, understand it's dramatic, and C, it doesn't need any further comment. So when he does his meter, He's expecting you to already know this outline. There's an occurrence, and then it's going to occur again in the future. Here, and it's going to occur again here. And of course, the person at the time, in the past, before these events occurred, they don't know what it is. They're going to know, though, within a few years of its occurring, just like I know what this is going to mean upcoming, even though I'm right now here. Why? because I saw the prior occurrences of this. I don't need Luke to tell me what it is. I know what it's going to be. My problem here is establishing to you how come this is a valid interpretation. And of course if you disagree with it let me know. But this is where it's coming from. That's the point I'm trying to make. Luke therefore does not use this phrase at all. So again we're talking about three ideas. Semion sign, first of which is high, he's directly talking through his word, and it's dramatic in a historical event. Second, it's him versus a false Christ, and it's a kind of appearing either directly or through his word or through a historical event that makes you think about God. This is the one that's a historical event that makes you think about God, or ought to. So Luke doesn't elaborate on it. Luke doesn't mention this phrase. Okay, there's another phrase Luke doesn't mention, which is parousias. He never mentions that. So now we have to go into that, because that's an anaphora of its own. First place it occurs is right here in verse 3. You're appearing. Alright, the first place it's actually occurred where Christ replies is right here in verse 27 right here. Parousia tu huyo tu antropo. And I sort of covered that already. Sorry, I had to take a break. I thought I was going to cough. That's 863 AD. I already explained that. That was the year that Louis the German conquered Moravia and he ordered um, um, the conversion of the Moravians to Christianity and the conversion to Christianity was accomplished first by means of them developing an alphabet that the, that the Moravians could read which is the Cyrillic script invented by a guy named Cyrus and Methodius who were the two evangels as it were to the Moravians. They, they translated the Bible into Moravian using a Cyrillic script and it's because of them that Russia got evangelized Russia, who coincidentally, ha ha, not so coincidental, three years prior to this had just finished raiding Byzantium. Russia was pagan at the time it did this. It did not know that what it took as plunder would include Bible because it was on this really expensive vellum. But Cyril and Methodius would know what it was when they looked at it because they could read the Greek. And so Methodius, in a way, Methodius and Cyril representing the appearing of the Son of Man through Scripture 
they're also getting the appearance of the Son of Man to them by the plunder by the Russians. So the Russians end up getting evangelized. Cyrus and Methodius end up getting manuscripts they didn't have because Byzantium was raided. And Russia gets converted. That's the appearing of the Son of Man to you when you didn't know he existed. That's Isaiah 52:15. Those who never heard of him, they now see. Those who never heard tell of him, they now well know. Okay, that's Isaiah 52, 15, in, which is part of Isaiah 53 in the Hebrew. That's happening right here. So that's a parousia. That's an appearing of God to you. And that's the first time it occurs. And notice, that's the sevening. Every single time you got this phrase, parousia tu huil tu anthropo, it's sevens. Every single time. So that tells you it's important, that tells you it's planned. Sheba is seven, seven means promise, it also means the seventh day of the week and seven. That's the appearing of the Son of Man, the promise of his appearing. <coughs> Sorry about the coughing. All right, every single time it's gonna seven. Now, so let's go through that. That's 833, which is 863 A.D. Okay, there's another key phrase that's similar to it. Huion to anthropo, son of man still, but without the key word parousia. See, here's the key word parousia. Alright, but it's not in verse 30 because it expects you to know that. This occurrence of those words is divisible by seven versus the last time it appeared. In other words, if I were to measure the distance between these words and this, it's divisible by seven. All right, I've already done the math on this, so I'll just expect you to just do it yourself. Okay, when you do the sevening, it either sevens at the start of the definite article or after words. Sometimes it occurs in the middle and I'm not sure what to say about it when it occurs in the middle. But it's always a seven difference. So the next time it's differential by seven even though see in verse 30 here okay that doesn't seven. Now it might be that it should seven. That might really be 938. I don't really know yet. I have to play with it. But so far it doesn't look like it's sevens. Alright, the next time it occurs um, see it occurs twice in verse 30 and the differential between this occurrence and this occurrence is also divisible by seven. So it's deliberate. The wording order, the words that are put in there. Because you don't need to say to, to huio to anthropo. You could just leave out the to. But it's in there. It's a monadic use of the definite article, but it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes it's not. Why is it that way here? In order to make it seven. Why is that important to show that God is planning the time? Alright, so it shows up here and it shows up here in verse 30 twice. So this is a really important time of history. Now why is that important? Well, it turns out, if you go study the history, the, the, even though the word appearing is not there, this is when the Vikings, you know, because the Vikings are really in three or four groups. The Russian branch is one of them. Then there's another branch that they call German. Then there's another branch that they call Norman. And then there's another branch they just call Vikings that goes to the... the the Americas, okay, and Britain. This is the time when they end up getting evangelized. So it's always got the same theme as it had here, evangelization. God appears to you. You didn't know about him? Well, now you do. You say yes or no, but he appears to you as it were through his word. See, parousia. Now the word parousia is not reiterated here but the rest of the phrase because the full phrase is parousia tu huio tu anthropo see they're looking for the signs of his appearing his appearing so 
So his nickname from Daniel 7.13 is Tuhuyo Tuantropo. Tuhuyasto Tuantropo. Now Christ himself is making that phrase. The actual phrase in Daniel is not, doesn't have those two articles in it. He's saying he's the only one. When he's got those two articles in it, that's Greek for saying, hi, I'm the only one. It's called monadic. All right? It's not son of man, okay, at all. That's not, you know, the, the actual words in the Hebrew of Daniel 7.13 are bar and nosh. It's not ben adam. Ben adam means son of Adam. And that's not what this is saying. This is anthropo, not Adam. So this is the unique use of Daniel 7.13 in the New Testament that Christ himself coins. Alright, so it's him and him alone. Not a false Christ. That's the important thing. So we have the phrase repeated here, and then it's repeated again here. The distance is always seven. And see, it, instead of using appearing, you got words like coming. And see, here's Samayon. So it's still talking back to Matthew 24, verse 3. All right, and the distances between these terms is divisible by seven, even if the ending clause is not. But when you have parousia as the clause, then it's divisible by seven, the, the actual total. And we see that the next time here in verse 42. Is it verse 42? Ah, no, verse 39. Parousia tu cuyo tu antropo. Okay, and then before that, up here, parousia tu cuyo tu antropo. See? Now what does that signify? Well this is 1255 AD and what was significant about parousia then is the word is appearing suddenly all over Europe in a form of a revolutionary new Bible format that was invented by the College of Paris. There were two, ha two places in Europe that were prim principally responsible for creating this new format of a Bible that made it extremely easy to read. It was, the two houses were in Paris, and I want to say it was Milan in Italy. might not have been Milan, it was, but it was definitely Italy. It might have been in Rome. And at this point, everybody's expecting, this is what's so ironic about this, everybody was expecting the appearing of Christ in 1260 A.D., that's why it was so popular to get these Bibles. They're really easy to handle. They, they could fit, you could hold it in the palm of your hand. It wasn't like other Bibles before. It had verses, it had chapters, it had tables of contents, it had um, little, little lexicons about how you can decipher the Hebrew names. It was meant to be a personal study aid. It was carried by the Dominicans and the Franciscans primarily. And they went running around Europe using these Bibles so it made it real popular to get one and they were cheaper to get that way too alright and everybody was expecting Christ to actually come see Parousia arrive they were expecting him to come in 1260 AD because the Bible has already been so popular at this point and everybody was reading it they were misreading Daniel 11's 1260 See, that's how you know how popular the Bible was. They were expecting him to come in 1260. It was so popular that they were misreading it. So when you got a bunch of people misreading, that means they had it available and they were reading it. You have to read it in order to misread it. That's what was so important. And they turned him down. When 1260 comes and goes, the Bible suddenly stops being popular. All right? And then at this point, there's a huge um, sort of like backlash due to the arguments between the church of Rome and the church in Byzantium. And this was also the period when that was going on right here. A bunch of manuscripts come out of Byzantium at that time because the Latins take over and sack Byzantium. All right, now they get their hands on Greek manuscripts. Again, it's the same theme as we saw back in 863.
They sack Byzantium. They get their hands on a bunch of manuscripts. Now they're translating them. They're looking at them. They're getting better translations, blah, blah, blah. And by this point, 1339, those better translations, etc., have come out. But because people are bored, because of the appearing of the Lord didn't happen in 1260 the way they misinterpreted it, they don't pay attention when this bigger cache of manuscripts is actually translated and made available. So what happens after 1339? Well, if you know your history, you know. Starting in 1348, well, just before this 1339, the Jews start getting expelled. That's always a sign of negative volition to God. The Jews start getting expelled. They go to Poland and Milan for the most part. And the Black Death comes in starting in 1348 which is a few years after this 1339 marker here. So Christ appears, they get negative, they expel the Jews, and then the Jews went to Poland and Milan. And those are the only two places that got exempted from the Black Death. And the Black Death kept on coming back and back again and again and again. In 1290, for example, see this 1246 or 1276, 1259, that's 1289, so starting right here, Acre. That's when England expelled its Jews. Well, about actually 94, so that's, that's 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. In the middle of Hamaras, in the middle of those days, they start expelling the Jews from England. And then they go to France, and they expel them from France, and then they go to Spain, and then they expel them from Spain. There were many expulsions. And so, when they get expelled, they go to a new place, and the new places they went to where they were welcome were in Milan and Poland. Because remember, back up here, Moravia, Moravia, Poland, Russia, they all got affected by this little thing that happened here, the Perusia here. And unlike everybody else, there were a, at least a few in Poland and Milan who really cared about the Word of God, so they allowed the Jews to come to them, and then wherever the Jews went, they were exempted from the plague. They hit everybody else who expelled the Jews. So you see how this is pretty important. And you'll notice, of course, God appears, and it's sevens. Here... And here, just like back in 833, where we saw it the first time, sevening, parousia tu anthropo. Okay? Now, the last time that it sevens is, I want to say, verse 42 or 44. Well, here's guias tu anthropo. Again, there's a sevening to the last time that the phrase was used and the total doesn't seven but the but when you count the syllables from one occurrence to the next occurrence of the phrase it does seven okay so I don't see another I guess 39 is the last one then there's another one all the way at the end in Matthew 25 which is way future to us um, was it Matthew twenty five forty one? Ooh, or forty four? There's one more occurrence. I'm I'm missing it now, but there's one more occurrence of parousia to to anthropo, to huia to anthropo. But that's way future compared to us. The point is, is that it's sevens each time. So the next one is at a seven, but I just don't remember where it is right now. I put it in the Frank Forum thread. Okay? So that's our second anaphora. And again, it's dramatic. It's dramatic about the Bible getting out and arriving to people. It's dramatic about the missionary activity. It's dramatic about the translation of the Bible. It's dramatic about people being able to understand, even to the point of misunderstanding and misusing, what the Bible says, like they misuse it here to think that in 2060 AD that's when Christ is supposed to come back. 
So he's making, he's sort of, you know, mocking that. But at the same time, they really were interested enough to get all these little tiny Bibles that Dominicans and Franciscan friars were carrying with them everywhere they went. And then, of course, the richer people were ordering them. Because they were, the, they were pretty, they were the, this was the first time in history that the Bible that we have, that we look at, came to have that same format that we have today. That's how, that's how you learn what parousia tu antropo, tu huyo tu antropo means. It's by looking at the history. And again, it happened again, and then those Bibles start to go out of fashion here. So the plague comes in. If you don't want the appearance of the Son of Man, how about the appearance of a plague? You don't want the appearance of the Son of Man, so you kick out the Jews? Okay, so how about the appearance of the plague? Because without the Jews, you don't have the Hebrew Old Testament. Vote short. They didn't vote the way they should have in time. So, the next seven years, they're judged. You know, there's seven more years that happen, and then they're judged. Because 1339 plus 7 is, seven is 1346. See how that works? So it's pretty predictable what this stuff means as an anaphora. Alright? So now we have to get to the next occurrence of another term that's used similar because as we started back up here, remember there's three basic terms we're explaining. Samayan, which we've kind of covered now. Him, Christ, versus false Christ. And parousias, which we just covered now. The next thing we've got to cover has to do with the actual word Christ or Lord. Okay? And that's what we'll cover next in the next increment. Because that's also the separation between the occurrences of the word Lord, which is where I'm getting what I'm saying about Trump. They're also divisible by seven. 